So today is intro to the entrance tank, and I want to first give a little bit on what the entrance tank is and why it matters. Um, so this is the intro to the entrance tank. You've got a, an image there, um, and I want to just like, let's, let's walk through this. So water comes from, remember this, the image of the river that we saw in one of the earlier classes? It comes from the river or it comes from a mountain stream somehow and is coming through a pipe and enters the plant. And here I show a pipe entering from above and water discharging with this red arrow. And then that water um, is on the upstream side of a trash rack. This trash rack that I'm showing right here actually doesn't show full detail, but that the trash rack um, is likely made of wires or cables that are spaced with a, a small spacing in between each wire so that leaves and debris can't get into the plant. Um, and you can imagine why that's important. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, the, the green line is showing the water level and it's showing that there, there is going to be a drop in water elevation as it goes through the trash rack that's called head loss. There's a drop in energy because we're using energy to push the water through the trash rack. And then the, okay, so now we, the trash rack helped us remove large particles, debris and twigs and even small branches, um, depending on how big the pipeline is from the, the water going into the plant. So that ends up protecting the rest of the plant. And then the, the other thing that is in the water that would end up being a nuisance in the rest of the plant is grit. So think sand and also slightly smaller than sand, um, particles that are heavy enough that they will settle out pretty quickly. And if we don't capture them here, they will settle out in the next process, which is a flocculator. And nothing terrible happens. It's just that it accumulates in the bottom of the flocculator and then the operators have to pull the, the baffles out of the flocculator and clean the flocculator. And that's a bit of a hassle. So we prefer to take the grid out in the entrance tank. And the way that happens is there are these pipes. You see these three, well, there's actually four of these white pipes and those white pipes are essentially plugged into a, a PVC coupling that is embedded in the concrete in the bottom of the tank. And when the operator wants to drain the sludge of, of sand and grit out of one of those hoppers, they just grab a hold of that white pipe, grab a hold of one of these white pipes right there, and they just pull it up and it pops out of the, the socket that it's in at the bottom of the tank. And the, the sludge can drain into a channel that's right below the tank and that ends up being connected to the, the drain system for the plant. Um, and then if we continue further down, we get to, here I was nasty, I just said LFOM and you're like, what in the world is an LFOM? Well, that's our short um, unpronounceable acronym, LFOM, um, that we use to measure the flow rate for the plant. And we'll talk more of that in, in an upcoming lecture. So that the, it is the linear flow orifice meter, abbreviated LFOM. Um, and it's what allows the operator to know what the flow rate is going through the plant. Oh, and, and there's here there's, there's just one um, confusion about what sets the flow rate of water in a plant because Inevitably, someone thinks that the flow rate through the plant is based on how much water is in the river and that if it rains a lot, a whole lot of water goes through the water treatment plant. That's not what happens. There's a valve somewhere in the pipeline delivering water into the plant and the operators adjust that valve to control how much water is coming into the plant. So if it rains, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't necessarily mean that more water is coming into the plant. Granted, if there's a drought, there might be less water coming into the plant because there's not enough water there to serve the community. But 
flow rate through the plant is controlled by a valve, not controlled by how much water is necessarily flowing in the, the stream or river. Um, okay, so the LFOM allows the operator to know how much water they're actually sending to, to the rest of the plant for treatment. And then there's gonna be a, a place to inject chemicals. And we don't actually show this in our design yet. Um, with a bit of luck, by the time we get to the end of the semester, I'll be able to have some images showing how that all works. Um, so that was, that's one introduction. Um, let's see, I went through this. So those are the four things and I just talked about them. So I don't need to go into that. Um, here's a few pictures from real Agua Clara plants. So the one on the, the left is at Moroseli. And that's the town that I was showing you earlier that has this river as a water source. And um, there's a part here that bothers me right away. And that is that this, this trash rack, which you can see right here, the holes in it actually look pretty big. And I'm pretty sure they're bigger than what they should be. Um, and that's because we didn't always have this clear in our design protocol. Um, the holes have to be smaller than anything that is likely going to happen downstream in the plant. And there's a restriction in the bottom of our clarifier that is maybe like four millimeters. And that means that the holes ought to be four millimeters or smaller. Um, and those holes look more like a centimeter. So they're too big. Um, so there's things that we're still learning as we go. Um, the, the image that I show in the middle actually looks good. Those, those holes are closer to the right size. I have a sense of what the scale is in that image. Um, and there's also a, a, another version of an entrance tank on the right um, showing the same things, water coming in through this big white pipe here, um, flowing now from top of the screen to bottom of the screen. And, and here's the linear flow orifice meter. And also ah, in both of these, there's a place where the flow rate is actually kind of being monitored with a dosing system. That's what this piece is right here. And we'll talk about this uh, in some of the next lectures. So there's a dosing system visible in both of these. Oh, yeah, I, I was being sarcastic and I said, keep on moving, nothing interesting here. Um, you know, there's, how, why would you care about an entrance tank? It's just like where the water enters the plant, that can't be that interesting. And indeed you will find water treatment plants where they don't ha have any significant part, they don't have the entrance tank as, as part of the design. Um, we recognize it as being a, a critical part of the design. It's what protects the plant from stuff that shouldn't be getting into the plant. Um, and we have a lot of experience with water supplies where the water coming in the pipe contains lots of stuff that would be a royal pain for the rest of the plant. So it does really matter. Um, and it's, although there's no, um, like it's, there's no complicated chemistry happening here. There's no really exciting physics. It's just stuff is settling out or being strained, but it's, it's an important part of the plant. So I change this to mess this up and the plant will be a pain to operate. So it does matter what you do with this, with this system. Um, so now I want to switch to doing a demo. Um, my first step will be to take you to an entrance tank that is the design that we have in Onshape. So here we are inside Onshape. This is in, in our public demo folder. Um, and if, if it isn't clear how to get there, you can send Claire a question and Claire will figure out how to get you to the public demos. Um, so the first thing I notice is that it's kind of hard to show you what's going on in this. And so I'm going to get rid of this wall. I'm going to do that by just selecting the wall and then pressing Y and Y will make it disappear. And now we can see into our entrance tank and let's see, first of all, the water is flowing from right to left in this view. Obviously I could flip this around and look at it from the other side, but it's, it's going from right to left. The water is entering in one of these two pipes right here. And I don't know which one. One of them is bringing water in from the water source and the other one has the 
potential to be bringing water in from a pump that is recycling water that was previously used to backwash a filter. So there can be a recycle within the plant. And so there's two sources of water coming into the entrance tank. This next pipe is used to um, dump water if the water level gets too high in this tank. So if, some, if the operator forgets to clean off the trash rack and the, the water level uh, begins to rise in this first part of the tank, it'll dump the water and just dump it into the, the drain channel. So that's like an emergency overflow. These red pipes are the ones that I said the operator can just grab a hold of and lift them up. Um, let's, let's do that with one of them. So I'm gonna remove this one. And what it does is it leaves a hole in the bottom of the tank and that, that hole connects to this channel that's underneath. Okay, so that, that's how, remember what gets out of here? What goes through that hole that we don't want? It's where the grit goes. The grit and the sand that accumulate, that come in from the river, they get in these hoppers. And you might say, well, why didn't you use a valve there? So that the operator could just open up a valve and let the grit out. Um, there's two reasons. One, we have this goal of having the bare minimum of valves in our plants because valves are moving parts and they will fail. And the second reason is that grit is terrible for valves. Grit is like the worst thing you wanna have going through a valve because that grit, when you try to close the valve down, the grit's gonna get caught, caught in the valve mechanism and slowly ruin the valve. Um, and so if we did put a valve there, it would be, undoubted that within the first year, um, the operators would end up breaking it out of there because it was, was just a source of problems. So th this very simple method of a, a pipe that's plugged into a, a coupling, a PVC coupling. So this piece right here is a standard PVC coupling that you can buy at the hardware store. And that's what's embedded in the concrete in the bottom of the tank. Um, so that's how this, how the grit gets out. Anybody want to ask a question? If you do, and I know that you might be shy, feel free to just pop questions into chat. Um, and now, what else is left? So we got rid of the trash, we got rid of the grit. Uh, oh, notice um, for the trash, um, here there are two trash racks back to back with the idea that they can pull one out and clean it, and there's still one there in place to catch incoming leaves. Um, and then at the far end, um, first of all, here's, this is the linear flow orifice meter with a cool pattern of holes and we'll understand why that matters and how that works later on. Um, and then on the wall, we have a scale. Um, this plant was designed for 40 liters per second. So the scale goes up to 40 liters per second at the top here. Um, and for lower, for less flow, the water level would be lower. Um, fewer of the holes would be used as the water is exiting the entrance tank and entering the LFOM. The LFOM is going to be dumping water into the flocculator, which is not shown here, but that would be the next tank. It would be right next to this entrance tank would be a flocculator. Um, and then there's one more pipe we haven't explained, and that's that's this one. This is a, a new part of our design. Uh, we've had a request to include an option for bypassing the flocculator and clarifier in the plant. And so this pipe, what the operator would do is they would pull the, the LFOM out of its socket and they would pull this pipe out of its socket and they would swap them. And that would, you see what would happen? If I swap these two pipes, the, the LFOM would now be over here and this pipe would prevent any of the water from going into the flocculator and the water would instead, instead be coming down this pipe, which isn't shown completed here, but this pipe ends up connecting around to the downstream end of the plant um, where they could run it through the filters um, and just, just filter. So that's an option if they had high quality water, 
they wanted to bypass the plant, or if there's something happening in the plant and they had to do some maintenance and shut maybe the entire flocculator off for a little bit, they could still bypass and continue to treat the water with just a filter for a little bit. Anybody have any questions? All good? Okay, now the real fun begins. So I took um, the entrance tank template and just like you're gonna do for this next uh, design challenge, I made a copy of it. And now I'm going to play. Um, and I just wanna show you some pieces about how Onshape works and why it, all, why it makes sense, like what's going on behind the scenes. So I'm in the part studio view. And one of the things that I want you to think about is that this left-hand column here is like a series of of command or a series of, of computer code. And it executes from top to bottom. So that means that the very first thing is it figures out you know, where the origin is and what the, the, the different planes are. And then it does whatever next we tell it to do. Um, and it does it in order. Um, so let's, let's begin by, let's make a sketch. So I'm gonna put a sketch and I'm gonna put it in the top plane and I'm gonna draw a rectangle and so far so good. And then I wanna put a dimension on one of those sides. So I selected a dimension key and, and I could just type a number in, okay, 1.2 meters. And that's one approach, that's like version one. Next step up, Let's not put a number in there. Let's put a variable in there. So let's try this again. And I can put a variable in there that I can just define right now. So to put a variable in, I'm gonna put in the pound sign and it gives me an option for the variables that are available, none of which are gonna do me anything because none of them are length. So none of them make any sense, but I have an option for making a new variable. So let's select new variable and I'm gonna create a new variable that's gonna be part of the configuration for this part studio. So I'm gonna click on configuration and it is a length and let's call it, um, let's call it tank L. Okay, and it's default is 1.2 meters and that all looks good. So I'm gonna say, yes, do that. I'm gonna say, there it is. Look, see now typed tank L in here, all is good. I hit enter and and I've got my sketch and look, it created that variable right here. So now I can change this length to 0 0.5 meters and my sketch changes. Wasn't that cool? You see how easy that was? I just created a sketch. I said, I want a new variable. I created that variable and I've got the ability to now control that sketch. Um, okay. And that's pretty cool. And you will you will find, look, in Onshape, there are so many different ways of doing things. And there are times when this is the right approach. For much of our work, we've found that these dimensions actually are calculated values and there's multiple equations behind them. And so we wanna have that code somewhere. And so it doesn't really work nicely for us to do this as a configuration variable, because instead we wanna have code calculating that. So. Um, let me show you how that works. So let's get rid of this tank L. I'm going to go over here to, oh, gonna go over here to configurations. And this tank L, I'm going to delete it again. And that's gonna break my sketch. I hope. Yes, so now my sketch is red, it's unhappy. I can go up here and look at the, the feature script notices and it should give me some information about what's going on. And it's saying, hey, this variable has not been found. Um, and the way I can troubleshoot this is I can open up the sketch and you know, you all know what happened, right? I deleted the variable that I used in the sketch. So I broke it. So we look up here and sure enough, there's this variable or this dimension is all red. And we go here and it's and that's all red and it's saying, give me a, a legitimate expression because tank L doesn't exist. 
okay, so let's just hold this. I'm gonna leave that and we're gonna fix that by entering that variable a different way. So that's broken right now. Um, okay. So now I wanna take you into the world of feature script. So over here is this other panel with feature script. And in here, um, there's, okay, a little bit of background. The way that our Clutter Reach uses Onshape is novel. So we're doing things with Onshape that Onshape had not even anticipated. And I know this is a little bit crazy, but we are, we, we have more code in Onshape than anyone else. So we are the biggest coders in Onshape, even though there are lots of big companies using Onshape. Um, and it's because of how we're thinking about design as putting all of our calculations right in Onshape. <clears throat> so some of this is, this is approaches that we devised based on our need to design these water treatment plants. Um, so here's this, this data structure at the top here, which is where you can create new variables on the fly that are inputs to your design. Um, and we've already added some here, but we just have commented them out. So right here is QM max, which is the, the flow rate that you might wanna use for a design. And I can uncomment, right now it's commented out, I can uncomment it by hitting control slash, and that will uncomment it. And all of a sudden it's live. And what does it mean? It's, it's this, this no, notation here is that this is an array and it's got three values. It's got a, a six, a 20 and a hundred. And we interpret that as um, a minimum, a default and a maximum. So six is a minimum value that this flow can have. 20 is, is the default value and a hundred is the max. So this is, we're like forcing ourselves to think about for every input, what's a reasonable range that it would be working over. And it also means that our inputs have default values so that even if we don't tell it anything, the default will be there and we'll be able to create a design. So I just made that one change. I, I uncommented QM max. And so let's submit this and let's go back here to the to the part studio and see what happened. So I'm gonna look at variables. So over here on the, the right is the variable table and notice QM max just showed up. So that flow rate is a variable and the notation, you're wondering like, what does QM max mean? So let's go to where we have our variables defined. So this is the, the definition page for how you define names for variables in the system. And this is important because, well, let me go back and show why this matters. There are no units anywhere here. See that? There are no units. And there's a reason for that. Um, and we are applying the units automatically based on this character, Q. And the, the way we're doing that, and, and notice that by the time that variable got over here to the variable table, it has units of meters cubed per second. The way those units were put onto the variable is that here's our variable table. And this is, we, we use a Q to define that variable and the units are meters cubed per second. Um, and then I say here QM, is equivalent to liters per second. Why? Because um, the M is like milli and a U would be like micro. So the M is milli and that means that it's milli cubic meters per second and a milli cubic meter per second, do you follow me, is a liter per second, right? Because there's a thousand liters in a cubic meter. So a milli cubic meter per second is a liter per second and that's what's happening here. Um, so this little table is your friend when you're defining variables to make sure that it, our system automatically puts the right variable, um, right units on the variables. Okay, so now we have, 
we've defined QM. Um, I'd like to define a new variable. Um, I'd like to define a residence time. Oh, a residence time. Let's look over here. How do we get time? Um, I'm looking for time, looking for time. And there it is, TI, time. It's limited to units of seconds. So there it is, TI is, is a good name for a variable. Of course, I can put um, anything in front of it. So I could say, um, I don't know, contact. I could say contact TI and any, any words I put in the beginning don't matter. Um, and now it's in seconds, that's kind of awkward. So let's make it range from one hour, which is 3,600 seconds and a default of two hours and maybe a maximum of a whole day. And I bet you don't know how many seconds there are in a day, but I do because I've been around longer. Um, okay, so there's, I've just defined a variable. And if we go out here, that variable should show up. There it is, contact time, default 7,200 seconds. Okay, now you see where this is going? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some design work. So down here is this design function, pre-designer function, and I can play with my parameters. Um, these parameters, all these variables come in in a variable map that's called design. So for example, if I, if I print map design, and if I tell it to monitor up here is an option for monitoring the part studio. Um, oh man, I need to explain why this works. Okay. So when you're working in feature script in, in Onshape, nothing happens in feature script. Like as you're, as you're writing it, it's not executing normally. It's just sitting there. The only reason the feature, the feature script will execute is if it's being told to execute in this list of, of commands here. So right here is entrance tank. Okay, so let's just delete this for a second. Notice, notice over here, contact time and QM max are there as variables. If I delete entrance tank, those things all disappear, okay? Because those things were generated in this feature script and the way we got that feature script into our part studio is by over here, custom features in this workspace, there's entrance tank. This is a feature that is defined It's defined right here. That's where that feature is defined. Feature type name is entrance tank. And that's what we have to put in the part studio in order to make all of this amazing code execute. Somebody wants to ask a question, I'm sure, or I'm going too fast or something didn't make sense. Monroe, every time you click commit, is that like saving? It is like saving and it's, it's telling it to update and use what I've just um, finished in doing any calculations. Okay, so I, I just told it, okay, so back here, now I'm in feature script and normally feature script wouldn't execute, but I'm gonna tell it to monitor the entrance tank part studio. And what that does is it forces the part studio to execute and the part studio forces this feature script to execute. And that means I can watch in the feature script notices, which you get at by clicking on this little parentheses up here. I can see what's showing up in feature script notices. And I told it right here to print the map of design and it's sh it's showing me all the parameters that are defined inside design right there and the only reason that got there is because i'm monitoring the part studio if i quit monitoring the part studio it will go away 
because then this feature script won't be executing anymore. I'd like to, I'd like to create a tank of a certain volume. And in order to do that, I need to figure out what that volume is gonna be. And I have as an input that I'd like it to have two hours of residence time and I have a flow rate. So given a flow rate and given a residence time, if I, if I take the flow rate and I multiply by the residence time, I'm gonna get a volume of water, right? So my tank volume, which I can create like this, I'm gonna create a new entry in this map of variables called design. And it's the new variable is gonna be tank volume. And that VOL is important because that comes from over here in our list of variables. Right here is volume, volume of a tank. So design.tank volume um, is equal to, and it's going to be, and I can access the variables that are available as design.qm max times design dot contact ti. And, and it's complaining that you can see that this is red and this should be like, oh, 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 something's wrong, something's wrong, gotta fix this. Okay, so this feature script notices is telling me there's something really bad right now and I don't know what it is. And down here it says, hey, you're missing a semicolon, okay? So let's put the semicolon in there. There's always a semicolon at the end of each line of code, um, almost always. And now it's happy and I have a tank volume. Um, oh, and if I put print map design down below this, it would now have a, a new entry. So I'll, let's commit that and see if we get it. So look, now we have a tank volume, 144 cubic meters. Um, and then um, let's assume that we, there's always constraints for, okay, great question. What is residence time? This is just, if I have water at 20 liters per second flowing into this tank and then flowing out again, and if the tank is full, the water will spend on average two hours in this tank. That's its residence time in the tank. Um, and the other question is what programming language is this? This is feature script. It is a, a language that was created by Onshape to as the basis for the entire um, the entire CAD environment. So every single thing that you do in Onshape is actually done in feature script, just that sometimes the feature script is hidden for you because you're using a feature that incorporates feature script that you're not looking at. So for example, if you go into the Onshape standard library, you can find their, their code that they've written in feature script to do the extrudes and the sweeps and the, and the lofts and everything that's done in Onshape is done in feature script. So that's why these, these entries in this menu, or not menu, but in, in this Heart Studio list really are lines of code executing in feature script. Okay, so we have a volume now. Um, the next question is, I wanna make a tank. Let's assume that this tank has a certain height that we're, we're giving as a constant. So let's create another constant up here that is tank H um, and let's set this to be, uh, I don't know, somewhere between one, two and four meters. So there that is. Okay, notice that right now the formatting is funky, right? This tank H is all the way to the left and it shouldn't be there. So one very nice check to make sure that everything is working well is you go up here and you click on the formatting button. And if your code is intelligible to Onshape, it will allow you to format it. On the other hand, if your code is not intelligible to Onshape and you press format, 
it will refuse to do anything because it's like, I have no idea what you are trying to do. Um, and in that case, it's like, hey, there's some extraneous input. I was expecting a comma and you didn't give me one. And it's because I was missing this comma right there. And when I do that, everything gets happy again. Okay, so I've just defined a new parameter tank H and that shows up in the list of variables that are, that are defined. It's got a value of two meters. Um, and now I'd like to define the, the width of the tank. Anybody have any ideas of how I could find the width of the tank given what I know so far? I know how deep it is and I know it's total volume. So how do I find a, a, an estimate of the width and the length? Let's assume that width and length are the same. I get a square tank. So let's see, design dot tank L equals design dot tank volume. And I'm gonna divide that by design dot tank H. So now that is tank volume divided by tank H is like the plan view area of this tank. And I'd like to, um, I'd like to, take the square root of that, and that will give me the, the length of one side. So let's do that. Let's take the square root. There it is. And, and that ought to make it happy. Try formatting, formatting works, let's commit. And look, tank L is 8.4 meters. We got it, okay. Um, and, but you know what, let's do, let's go one step further. This tank L, 8.48 meters, um, just for fun, let's pretend that we'd like to round that to maybe the nearest 20 centimeters. Okay, how could we do that? So I don't want this to be 8.48 meters. I want it to be either 8.4 meters or 8.6 meters. So let's round it so that it's easier to construct this thing. And we can do that with the round function. Um, and as soon as I type in round, it gives me some options. Um, one option here, it says round of the value, but I'd like another option. Look, here's another option, round to a nearest given multiple. So I'm gonna use that one. So I'm gonna round my tank L, that's the value. And what's the multiple I wanna use? I wanna use like 20 centimeters. So let's, let's type in, or 40 centimeters. I don't know, let's use 20. 20, and I can just type in centimeters. I have to put units here because the square, well, tank L has units of meters. And, and it doesn't matter, I could have typed in 20 centimeters or I could have typed in 0.2 meters. It doesn't make any difference. That's the same number. Does that make sense to you? 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters is the same thing from Onshape's perspective. So I can do it however I'd like. And so let's commit that and we'll see if tank, tank L now changed. Now it's 8.4 meters. So it rounded it to the nearest 0.2 meters. And now let's go back and look at our tank. So I'm gonna move the roll bar down and, and look, our, our sketch is happy again because I've redefined what tank L is. Remember at the beginning, I defined tank L as a variable in the configurations and it showed up right here. I then deleted that and it broke the it broke the the sketch and the sketch was angry at me and was red but then i created a definition for tank l over here in feature script right there it is and so the tank l that is used right there is defined again and it's happy
Okay, so there's a question about why I'm defining variables in certain parts of the code. So there's, there's really two places here. Um, up here, I'm defining variables that are that I'm thinking about as inputs. So they're, they're inputs that don't require any calculations. I'm not quite sure why they're all inputs. Maybe, maybe the, the customer who wants this design knows exactly what the flow rate is. And there's some other constraint that made it that the tanks that are available are two meters deep. Um, so those are inputs. And then down here, I'm doing calculations. So this is where I'm doing actual design work. And I'm taking those inputs and I'm doing additional calculations to calculate additional parameters. Corey, feel free to come back with more questions on that. Monroe, can I follow up a little bit with that? Yes, please. So one thing that, so this was something that was very confusing to me when I started using Onshape as well. And the import, like the thing that really stuck for me is that the stuff in the top are kind of your, like they're really the ingredients that you're using to make the rest of your design and everything. So I think of those as the parameters and everything else I think of as the variables, which are combinations of those parameters. Um, so anything that you're setting above, it's really setting the structure of everything that you're gonna be doing. Um, and the variables are, I, I like, I have a, I also, so you all know, there's a, a page on GitHub of like my trick, like my tricks to handling feature script so that you can like remind yourself of some of these little things that go in there. Um, but that the variables are just combinations of your parameters and those are the calculated parts. So if it's gonna count, if you have to calculate it, it's not a parameter. Right. Up here are things that a user who wants to design can just enter in these numbers and get a design. Um, what did I want to do next? Okay, so let's let's just take this one step further, um, and let's make well just for fun. Let's define a a tank W here. Design dot tank W. And just for simplicity, we're just going to say that's the same as design dot tank L. Okay, that was kind of silly, but I just find the new parameter. And <clears throat> I'm going to go edit this sketch. And I'm going to put a dimension on right here. And by the way, I, I did that by pressing D, that selects a dimensioning tool. And what variables are available to me? See, this list of variables is getting longer. So there's a lot of variables here, and I get I get to I get them to all pop up by hitting the the pound sign. And I want tank W now. Okay, so there's my new sketch. This is like the base of this tank, and now we can fill this tank in by extruding it. Just for fun, let's extrude. We're making like the volume of water that goes in this tank. So we're going to extrude this sketch. So I selected the sketch, and the depth is going to be how deep is the water in this tank? It's tank H. So it's right here, two meters deep. And that should do it. So there's my chunk of water. Now, <clears throat> up here are overrides. So an, a brief introduction to overrides. This is a little bit kludgy, but we had to do it this way to make things work inside Onshape. There's a whole other story behind us, but we can put in any of the variables that are in our inputs and we can control them directly here. So for example, QM max is one of our inputs. So I type it like that as a string. And then I enter the number and I forget what my lower bounds are, but I don't need to put units in here because it knows that QM, that Q has units of meters cubed per second. And when I change that, you see that it immediately changed the design. So my, okay, so look, we got a warning down here. The value of one cubic meter per second was less than the minimum value of six cubic meters per second. You know why that showed up? 
is because we had set that the minimum value for QM max was six and I typed in a one and it's like, you can't do that. So you see how this makes it so the user can't enter, enter in a value that's out of your range. And on shape or the way this is written, it will force the user input to be as close to being inside this range as it can. And so when I put in a one, it made it a six. If I want to go and extend that range, I can do that just by changing this. Now it can go all the way down to one. The error message down here goes away. And now my, my tank, my volume of water got even smaller. So let me just make sure that you're seeing this. When I change this to 10, my tank grows. Any questions about that? Um, so this okay. is a great question. Do you want to answer uh, it, Claire? So it is possible to scale it um, just upwards like that. So we what we're looking at here is an example of it. So this isn't what the final um, design is going to look like. So if we were to switch into one of the final designs that we have, and we were to just write in um, the new flow rate, everything would scale appropriately with that. Including here, if I change this to 10 liters per second, and I don't know how long this is going to take, it might take a little while. But in any case, all the pipes are gonna change size too. And it's gonna be the real pipes. These are gonna be the pipes that you can actually buy in a store. Um, it's not just randomly drawing something that's scaled. So look, now this pipe is a six inch schedule 40 PVC pipe. So it didn't just scale it. I wanted to break something and see what happens. So let's go back into the code here and let's just uh, let's just call this my tank W. Let's commit that and then let's see what happens. And we are immediately getting a variable not found and it's complaining in the sketch. So I, I know that the sketch is my problem. I open up the sketch. And this dimension over here is red. I double click on that and it's saying tank W is not available. So I could fix that by looking again, what are my variables that are available? And I changed it to my tank W for some silly reason. So I hope that one of the things that you noticed is that every step of the way, I'm making sure that things are working. Um, and as soon as something is broken, I fix it. Um, one of the big mistakes in code is to keep on coding furiously when it's already broken. You have to stop if it's broken and get it working before you proceed. I'm done with what I wanted to show today. Um, and I hope this like, gives you an intro to what you can do in Onshape. And now I think it's time for you to play. Anything else before we break up and start playing? Uh, Claire, do you have teams to put these students in? I do have teams. I uh, have a PowerPoint slide that I made that has everyone's, um, their teams on them. Um, so Patrick, there's gonna be 14 rooms. Um, and let me share that. Is it, there it is, share. So these are the teams. Let me make that a little bigger. Oh, sorry, start my slideshow. Where's the button for that one? Slideshow, there. So these are your, these are gonna be your teams um, throughout the semester. So what I will do is I will open the breakout rooms and then if you're team one, go to room one. 
et cetera. Um, and then when you get to the room, if you do not already know each other, introduce yourselves, name, major, to be one fun fact, and then maybe exchange email, one, phone, group me, however you would like to keep in contact with one another, kind of establish that. And then go ahead, Claire. Uh, one of the upcoming assignments is a team expectations document. Um, so that's going to be you all kind of agreeing on the way that you want to approach the assignments. Um, that's also going to be coming up with a team name. So don't feel attached to your team number unless you really are. Um, so that assignment will go into a little bit of the like dynamics and our expectations of what your team is going to be working as. Um, that's it. All right, so I have opened the rooms, so you should be able to, to join. Or maybe not. Oh, nope, some of you it's working. So if you're having a challenge getting to your room, 